Astronomy to GCSE, Topic 3.2, Observing the Night Sky. So 1. Okay, so what do the terms right ascension and declination mean? Remember I mentioned the celestial sphere earlier? Well, a celestial sphere is an imaginary sphere, so it doesn't exist. But on this sphere, all of the objects of the night sky appear to be projected. If you like, the celestial sphere is a globe where the Earth is in the centre. Just like a globe, the celestial sphere has coordinates. However, rather than having latitude and longitude, the celestial sphere instead has declination and right ascension. Any point in the night sky can be located by coordinates that refer to that point's declination and right ascension, just as any point on the Earth's surface can be located by coordinates that refer to its latitude and longitude. Declination replaces latitude and longitude as it's the horizontal lines. Declination is measured as an angle up or down from the celestial equator. The unit for declination is degrees, just like a normal angle. If you want the angle smaller than a degree, then the next smallest increment is a minute which is 1 60th of a degree. After that, we have a second, which is 1 60th of a minute, and 1 1,300th of a degree. Right ascension is the astronomical version of longitude, if you like. As the celestial sphere appears to rotate, it doesn't really, in fact, the Earth is rotating, but anyway, as the night sky rotates, Right ascension is expressed as a unit of time, which indicates how long between objects crossing your meridian. Just like longitude starts at the Greenwich meridian, right ascension starts at a selected point in the night sky. This point is the first point of Aries. Because of right ascension is a unit of time telling you when the constellational star will be directly above you, it is measured in hours, minutes and seconds. Right ascension starts in the east, or on a star chart on the right. The time then increases to the left of the star chart. This occurs as the Earth is spinning towards the east. 2. The declination of Polaris, the North Star. Polaris lies above the Earth's axis of rotation, the North Pole, which I've represented here in blue. This is why it appears not to rotate in the night sky, just how a tiny point in the middle of a spinning top appears not to rotate. So what is Polaris declination? If it sits directly above the North Pole, its angle from the celestial equator is 90 degrees. Therefore, the declination of Polaris is 90 degrees. So that's easy, the declination of Polaris is 90 degrees. Remember that declination does not change as it is a coordinate system for the entire night sky. 3. So we know that the declination of Polaris is 90 degrees. Remember this does not change depending on location as the declination tells you where on the celestial sphere Polaris is, not where in your night sky from your garden. Now what is the angle to Polaris from the horizon? Now this is from your garden. This is usually called the elevation of Polaris above the northern horizon, and it is always the same as the, the same angle as the latitude of the observer. If you're wondering why this is, it's due to some geometry that you can investigate if you wish. Just remember that if you are at the North Pole and Polaris will be directly overhead, 90 degrees above the horizon. So the elevation of Polaris above the horizon is the same angle as your latitude, e.g. if you're in London at 51 degrees north, then Polaris will be 51 degrees above the northern horizon, and if you're at the equator, Polaris will be 0 degrees above the horizon. So it will always be on the horizon if you're at the equator. Remember, if you're in the southern hemisphere, then Polaris will always be below the horizon, so you will never see it. That is why you can only observe Polaris from the northern hemisphere. 4. Circumpolar stars. Okay, so we've already got the idea that 
stars appear to rotate about Polaris, the pole star. This is because Polaris sits directly above the North Pole. In reality, the stars don't rotate, the Earth does. The Earth rotates from west to east. A circumpolar star is simply a star that from a given latitude never sets below the horizon. If the horizon for this image were here, then these stars would all be circumpolar as they would never go below the horizon. On the other hand, these stars shown in red are different as they do go below the horizon. They are not always below the horizon, but they can be. These stars are called seasonal stars. Seasonal stars set below the horizon. They can only be seen at certain times of year, as for some of the year, they are only above the horizon at daytime, making it impossible to see them. How to work out if a star will be circumpolar or seasonal. Waiting the entire night and seeing whether the star sets below the horizon takes a long time. Happily for us, there is an equation we can use to calculate whether a star will be circumpolar or not from a given latitude. Remember that the elevation of Polaris above the horizon is equal to the observer's latitude. So if our latitude is 55 degrees north, then Polaris will be 55 degrees above the horizon. Therefore, any star with a declination 55 less than that of Polaris will just touch the horizon. This star will be just circumpolar. As the declination of Polaris is plus 90 degrees, to be circumpolar, a star's declination must be greater than or equal to 90 minus the latitude of the observer. So remember, if this equation is true, the star will always be visible and therefore the star is circumpolar. A photo with a long exposure like this one will be able to show the apparent movement of the stars across the night sky. If the exposure time of the photograph is known, then the rotational period of the Earth can be calculated. Let us use this photo as an example. The exposure time, which is called the shutter speed on most cameras for this photo, is 6,786 seconds. I chose a lovely round number. If you do one rough measurement for the angle from Polaris to the two ends of the star trail, it comes to around 27 degrees. In more fancy terminology, this is the angle subtended by the star trail from Polaris. There is an equation, you don't have to remember it though, that can be used to calculate the time taken for the star to rotate about Polaris 360 degrees, which is the rotational period of Earth and also called the sidereal day. The equation is the rotational period of Earth is equal to 360 degrees times the exposure time, all divided by the angle of the star arcs. This may look strange, but trust me, it works. You don't need to remember the equation for the exam though. Let's now use the equation to calculate the rotational period of Earth using my photo. 360 times 6,786 seconds is 2,442,960. And 2,442,960 divided by 27 comes out at 90,000 480 seconds or 25 hours and 8 minutes. The rotational period of Earth is really 23 hours and 56 minutes, so we're quite a bit out, but there's a lot of error when measuring the angle. So that is how to calculate the length of the sidereal day. You can use this as part of your astronomy coursework. 5. Planning an observation session. When you are going to do an observation session, there are many things you need to look at or bring. Some of the most important things are planispheres, star charts, and computer software. Why? Because you need to know where to look for your stars. 
For your coursework, there's no point drawing stars if you don't know which ones they are. Planisphere, star charts and computer software are great ways to locate, name and find stars. You can actually get smartphone apps that name you the stars you're pointing your phone at. Let's create a kit list for a naked eye observation session. So we already have a star chart, planisphere or computer software for the planning and locating of stars. A red torch is essential as you will need light to draw and record data with. However, if you keep turning a torch with a white light on and off in order to see, you'll keep losing your night vision. The reason the torch needs to be red is that you will not lose your right night vision with a red torch. A clipboard is essential as finding a flat dry surface may be difficult and you want the best possible data for your coursework. A pencil and rubber, please do not forget to bring a pencil and rubber. You will have done all this preparation and work to get your location and will have no writing implement. Warm clothes. These are not always needed, but if you're observing stars at night, it will get cold, especially in the winter. Phones and maps. You may get lost and need to call for help and assistance. A phone is a great backup plan if the session goes pear-shaped and you forget a coat in winter or something like that. 6. Types of naked eye observation techniques. There are three types of naked eye observing techniques. These are techniques that enable you to see as many stars as clearly as possible. The first is dark adapted eye. This one is simple. Wait until your eye has become adapted to the dark. This is sometimes called getting your night vision, but don't call it that in the exam. Over a period of around half an hour, your eyes will adjust to the dark and become dark adapted. This allows you to see more stars more clearly. The next is relaxed eye. Relaxed eye is where you wear an eye patch. This allows you to keep the eye you are not using open and relaxed rather than keeping it shut. But the eye patch removes the distraction of the second image. The final naked eye observing technique is averted vision. Averted vision is where, to get the best image of a dim object, you look slightly to the side of it, rather than directly at it. This seems strange, that getting the best images requires not looking directly at an object, but this happens because the light sensitive cones in the centre of your eyes are better at picking up colour, but not so good in low light than the light sensitive rods which surround the cones. 7. The ecliptic and the zodiacal band. Back to the star chart. The funny curved line across the middle of the star chart is called the ecliptic. This is the apparent path of the sun on the celestial sphere. The lines plus and minus 8 degrees from the ecliptic form the outer edges of the zodiacal band. In this band are the constellations of the zodiac like Leo, Cancer and Gemini. And in this region of the night sky is where the planets and the moon are located. The ecliptic is not really the path of the sun, as the sun isn't really moving, it's us. To represent what the ecliptic is, have a look at this diagram. The ecliptic is the line the sun appears to follow on the night sky. 8. The Messier Catalogue A French astronomer from the 17 and 1800s called Charles Messier compiled a list of 110 astronomical objects consisting of galaxies, nebulae, planetary nebulae and star clusters. The Messier objects are just visible to the naked eye, and so are popular with amateur astronomers. You can even use them for your coursework. Examples of Messier objects include the Crab Nebula, which is M1, the first object in the Messier catalogue. 9. When stars culminate. Remember that the Earth rotates from west to east. And as the stars are fixed, this makes them appear to rotate from east to west, 
as observed from Earth. If you look due south, then you will see stars rising in the east, which is on your left, and then stars setting in the west, which will be on your right. This means that stars culminate when they are due south. Remember, culminate means crossing your meridian, which is an imaginary line going from the north pole to the south pole right over your head. So all col stars culminate when they are due south. It is possible to calculate when stars will culminate using data like their right ascension. Here are a few questions you might get. Which star appears highest? Remember that declination is up and down, and right ascension is left and right. For height, we want up and down, so the highest star is Alpha Orionis, as it has the highest declination. Equally, the lowest star is Beta Orionis, as it has the lowest declination. Right ascension gives the relative times when stars will culminate. This is why the units for right ascension are time. The later the time for right ascension, the later the star culminates. So a star with the latest right ascension culminates latest. As stars appear to rotate from east to west, the star with the latest right ascension is the most east. So here, Alpha Orionis is the most east, as it has the latest right ascension. Using this data, we can calculate when a star will culminate. So, if Gamma Orionis culminates at 1700, then when will Alpha Orionis culminate on the same day? Well, Alpha Orionis right ascension is 30 minutes later, therefore it will culminate 30 minutes later, so at 1730. On the same day, when will Delta Orionis culminate? Well, it is 7 minutes after Gamma Orionis, so it will cul culminate at 1707. Now, remember that the sidereal day, so the length of time between culminations for these stars, is 23 hours 56 minutes, or minutes shorter than the solar day. This means that if Gamma Orionis culminates at 1700, then the next day it will culminate 4 minutes earlier, as the sidereal day is 4 minutes shorter, so it will culminate at 1656. The day after, it will culminate at 1652. So if you get a question like, Gamma Orionis culminates at 1700, when will Alpha Orionis culminate the next day, remember to do all of the steps. Alpha Orionis will culminate 30 minutes later, so at 1730 on the same day. So the next day it will culminate at 1726. Remember, if you do all of this, the steps, these questions can be quite easy. You just have to take your time and do them logically.